We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Grab a copy of God's Word, open it up to the book of Job. If you don't own a copy of God's Word, I want to encourage you to take that Bible that you found in the sheet in front of you and write your name in it. We want you to have that. Uh, For a lot of us, over the next weeks, we're going to be going through the story of Job. And for, for a lot of us, the story of Job is a familiar story. Even if you didn't grow up in church, maybe you're not a Christian and you just kind of know a, a few of the stories from God's word, Job is probably one of those stories that most of us have heard of. And if you were to describe it in one sentence, you'd probably say it's a story about a really good guy who has a really bad couple of days, right? Right? And and while that's true, Job is so much richer than that description. And so we're going to take some time. We're going to look at the story of Job together and understand really all that's packed in here. Before I do, I want to give you a couple foundational truths. The first one is that we don't know who wrote Job. All right. I wish I could tell you that we know for certain. Most people believe that it was written by Moses, that Moses is the one who wrote down the story. Others would say that it's Samuel or Solomon or a few others. Uh, At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, okay? But we don't know who wrote it. The second thing that I want you to know, and this is uh, somewhat debatable in in different circles, some people would say that Job is a a parable, that it's a, a helpful fictional story that teaches us what God is like. And other people would say that Job is a true story, that Job is a real person, and uh, that these things really happened. And I want you to understand that we are going to teach from the perspective of our pastoral staff, uh, the leaders of this church. We believe that Job is an account of a true story that really happened. Now, if you disagree with me on that, that's okay. I still love you. You can still worship here. Uh, But I just want you to know that's the perspective we're going to teach this book from. And the reason why I believe that, there's a few passages. One is in Ezekiel where Job is listed amongst other real historical people. It's listing a historical people, and then Job is listed there amongst other real people that actually lived. The same thing happens in James chapter 5, where it lists real people, and Job is mentioned in that list of people. Uh, It says that Job is from this land called Uz, and that's a real place. And so for all those reasons, I don't believe that this is an allegory or parable. or something that was a fictional account. This is a true story, okay? And so it's important to know that. Everyone good so far? All right, today we're gonna try to get through Job chapter one, two, and three, but there's no way with the amount of time I have to teach through all of that. And so you guys are gonna have some homework today. I'm gonna teach through Job chapter one, the first part of Job chapter two, and then you all are gonna go home and read the second part of Job chapter two and all of Job chapter three on your own before next Sunday. All right. So today, as we're trying to get through Job 1, 2, and 3, uh, and just understand at least the, the, what's summarized in those three chapters, we're going to find four passages in Job chapter 1 alone, and they repeat back in Job chapter 2, that I call the, wait, what? Passages. All right. You know those moments where you hear somebody say something, and it doesn't make sense, and you're thinking, hold up, I need you to repeat that. That didn't make a whole lot of sense, right? And we would say, wait, what? Say that with me. Wait, what? And so you're going to see four of those today in just Job chapter 1. They're going to make you scratch your head and think, I think I heard the pastor wrong, because that couldn't possibly what be what Scripture says about that. All right, so we're going to show you four of those passages I'll tell you when they're coming so you know when you're supposed to say your line, all right? Okay. Job chapter 1, let's jump right in. It says, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. All right, real fast before we go on, I want you to know Job was a human just like you. 
He was not sinless. He was not perfect. But the way uh, the Bible describes him is that it was really, really so hard to find any fault in this guy that most people would look at him and say, I, I, I find no issues with this guy's life. He's a man who lives uh, a blameless life, complete integrity, fears the Lord. So Job is a pretty awesome dude, all right? So verse 2, it says he had seven sons and three daughters. Some simple math. How many kids does he have? Ten kids. He owns 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen. Teams of oxen. 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. So it's important also for context to understand that this real guy named Job, he's like Jeff Bezos if Jeff Bezos loved Jesus. All right? He's like Elon Musk if Elon Musk followed Jesus. He's like the richest guy in the land. Nobody's got more stuff. Nobody's got more camels and team of oxen and sheep and shepherds and all the... Uh, Job is, is loaded, okay? And it's important to understand, too, that's amazing, is that Job is described not only as incredibly rich, the richest person in his area, but also, he also still loved Jesus. He didn't let his wealth do what wealth often does, which is to pull people into the world and pull them away from fearing God. So that's important to understand. Let's keep uh, reading. Verse 4, it says, Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes. They would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Here's another thing we learn about Job. Job was a good father. He loved his children. His children got along. They enjoyed being around each other. This is like a solid family. And Job is thinking, listen, they just spent a whole weekend having a, a, a gathering together with the family. And, and sometimes when families get together for long periods of time, people think things, say things, and do things they're not that proud of. He said, just in case my kids did something that didn't honor God, Job, as a regular practice, would offer burnt sacrifices just in case. I mean, this guy loved his family. His family loved him. They all got along. He loved Jesus, had a ton of stuff. He was just a blessed man. All right, I hope you see all that by now. All right. Now, here's the first wait what passage. And I hope you guys remember to say your line as soon as I'm done reading, all right? It'll make this more fun, I promise, okay? Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Yeah, first service did better than y'all. One of you in here has got to be like, a, you know, you were in drama in high school, and you, come on, all right. And Satan came with them. I know, right? That's exactly what I was thinking. Like, what in the world is happening right here? You hear this story where, where God gets together. He has a staff meeting, right? He calls in the heavenly host. He's all right, everyone gather around for our staff meeting today. And then every, all the angels are coming in. The, the heavenly hosts are, are there. And, and, and Satan is there too. That's like, what is going on? Why is Satan at God's staff meeting? Have you ever wondered that? When you read this story, you're thinking, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, God is perfect. He's, he's righteous in him. There is no darkness at all. Like, I'm not even allowed in God's presence one day if I haven't given my life over to, to Jesus because I got all the sin and grossness in me. And somehow God, in fact, this is your first point. You ready? Number one, God allows Satan into his presence. To start this story, the foundational story for this whole series, you have to understand that for some reason that we will never understand, God allows Satan to join in his staff meeting and to be present. That's interesting. We have no idea why. You know, uh, my, 
my staff at this church and I, we, uh, we recently read this book last month. We read a book together each month. Last month, we read a fiction book called This Present Darkness. Have any of you guys read This Present Darkness before? It's a really interesting book because what it does is it opens your eyes to a powerful truth that Scripture already kind of recognizes that there is a whole lot going on in the supernatural realm that we in the natural realm aren't even aware of. That there are, there, there are entities in this room right now that you can't see with your eyes. Hopefully, angelic uh, heavenly beings are the ones present here in this room. You know, before you even get here on a Sunday, we have a team around 745 that gathers around in this place and we walk through the seats and we walk around this auditorium and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that this room would be cleared of all uh, demonic powers and that the entities that are guarding and protecting this room would be those from heaven. But think about, yeah, I want you to know... That Job in this moment, he's just minding his own business and he doesn't even know. He's not even aware that there's a conversation going on in heaven and that his name is about to come up in the conversation. There's things going on in a spiritual realm that you don't even know about that are happening right now. It's mind blowing. Think about this. Is there a chance that there's a conversation going on in heaven right now and your name's being mentioned? A conversation going on about you in heaven right now? Maybe. We don't know. So here's what God says in verse 7. He says, where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that goes on. Satan can't lie to God, so he just tells him the truth. I've been down on the earth, patrolling, doing what I do. What is it that Satan does? It's basically his job description, right? In 1 Peter 5.8, it gives you a really clear job description. Instead of using the word patrolling, it says that he's prowling around, right? It says, stay alert, right? In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's what the enemy does. He walks around trying to find people, trying to find marriages, trying to find relationships, trying to find families, trying to find jobs to destroy. He's looking to mess things up. He's been doing that since Genesis chapter 3. He just wants look around to find something that God has blessed and put together and something good and something noble and something righteous and he wants to destroy it. And so when God says to Satan, where have you been? What have you been doing? He's like, I've been down doing what I do. It's verse seven. All right, here's the next wait what message, passage, all right? Verse eight. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Now, some of you right now are thinking, why did we say wait what? That wasn't that interesting of a verse. I'm not scratching my head. Pastor, why did I just say, wait, what? And here's why. You probably missed it. Uh, Oftentimes we read right past this verse and we don't realize what just happened here. Notice that when Satan goes to this staff meeting, he doesn't have Job's name on his mind. Satan didn't show up saying, I'm going to show up and I'm going to ask for permission to go pick on Job. Job's the guy I want permission to pick on. Job isn't even on his radar. Who puts Job on Satan's radar? wait, what? (laughs) Like God says, here's some GPS coordinates. As you're prowling around, why don't you go check out this guy? Here's his address. Huh? Like why, why does God do that? Number two, and God directs Satan to Job not the other way around. God tells Satan about Job, 
Job doesn't come to God, or Satan doesn't go to God asking about Job. So let's, let's keep reading. Verse 9, it says, Satan replied to the Lord, yes. In other words, yes, I have considered Job. But Job has a good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Here's what Satan says. The only reason that Job honors you and fears you and loves you is because you have given him everything he wants and needs. You've blessed him, and so he's going to bless you. But if you allow him to be cursed, he's going to curse you. That's what Satan says. That's the deal, God. The only reason he loves you is because he's got everything. He's, everything's going well for the dude. But if you take away that, you'll see what really happens. So Satan lays down a a plan, a strategy. He says, take away his stuff and he'll take away his loyalty. And here's the third wait what passage for for this morning. Job chapter one, verse 12. God says, all right, you may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Right? Right? God goes and gives Satan permission to take everything that Job has, except for touching him physically. You can take everything else he's got, and he gives Satan permission to go in and grab it and destroy it and ruin it. This is number three. God permits bad things to happen to Job. God permits it. In fact, I want you to understand there's a kind of a hidden message in the number three right here. I want you to understand that Satan is incapable of doing anything to Job without God's permission. I want you to know about that in your own life. Satan can't do anything unless God allows it. With, without God's uh, allowing it, it never would have happened. But for some reason, God permits for bad things to happen to Job's life. He removes the protection around Job and he is about to allow some certain things to happen in Job's story. You know what interesting, what's interesting to me about why this is a wait what passage for me? Think about this for a moment. If we, had like a, if we found out that God permitted bad things to happen to like a, a serial killer, We'd all be like, yeah, man, he has it coming. Take everything he's got, take his life, take his, you know, take all his stuff, empty out his bank accounts. That totally makes sense to us, doesn't it? We're like, yeah, that makes sense. Over here, you know, you got some maybe terrorist or something. You're like, yep, wipe out everything that guy's got. God, he's got it coming. You know, over here, you have that neighbor whose dog keeps pooping on your lawn, right? And you're thinking, yep, he's got some things coming, God. You can go do whatever you want to that guy. But then we think about Job, a guy who fears the Lord, who, who loves his family, who even amidst all the wealth of the world chooses to continue to honor God. And you're thinking, wait, why would you allow Satan to do what Satan's about to do? We don't quite understand it. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Why would God allow all this to happen to Job? Let's keep hearing me say, why does God allow all this? What does God allow to happen to Job? We're going to read about this. We're going to read a lot of scripture right now. We're going to go from verses 13 to verse 19. Follow along in in the Bible. I want you to see all the things that Satan, he just got permission. He's probably super excited because he gets to go do what, what he knows how to do well. He's going to destroy this man's life. And here's what happens. Starting in verse 13, it says, one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabians raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And so while this first guy comes and gets, gives this news, hey, all your donkeys, 
all your oxen, and all the farmhands that control that part of your possessions, they're all gone now. You don't have them anymore. And while that guy is still speaking, right, it goes on. It says, uh, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Don't miss this. While he was still speaking, all right? So, you know, gut punch, sucker punch, and now this other guy comes in, and while he's still trying to, you know, recoil from what just happened to him, another guy comes in, all within one, like, fluid sentence. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. All right, it sounds pretty bad. But while that guy was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. You ready for this? Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Man, I have a hard time just processing one bit of bad news. You come to me with a bit of bad news, it can wreck my day for sure. It'll maybe even wreck my week. Really bad news, you tell me something I care about, someone I love, someone whatever is no longer with us, and that's gonna, man, it's gonna mess us up for a while. And this poor Job, he doesn't even have a chance to, to get the wind knocked out of him before he even catches his breath. Someone else is punching him, and he's got another sucker punch. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, take all my stuff, but don't touch my children. Think about this for a moment. What would you do in this moment if this were to happen to you? I'll tell you, I'll be real honest as your pastor. I don't want to know what would happen to me, what I would do if that ever happened to me. I'm afraid I don't think I'd be really uh, proud of my response. What would you do if this were to happen to you? Everything you had was taken from you, and then right when you found out about that, your children were killed. Just like that, all of them, all at once. Hmm. There was one year in my life where I lost a job, a home, uh, health insurance, and my dad all in the same year. That was a tough year. But it wasn't all within 50 minutes, and nobody touched my kids. Nobody touched my wife. Like I was able to get through, it's tough. But can you imagine if you experienced this kind of loss all at once? And it leads us to what I think is the biggest wait what passage in all of Job chapter one, all right? Let me read you the fourth wait what passage. And here's what it says. It says, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief and then he shaved his head and fell to the ground. Don't say it yet. Don't say it yet because you don't know the end of the verse. I didn't put the last two words up there yet because I want you to really feel the punch of what's about to happen. Job stood up and he tore his robe in grief, which makes total sense, by the way. Part of life, when you lose something you love, is grieving. That's a good, normal human interaction and reaction, right? So he tore his robe in grief and then he shaved his head and he fell to the ground. You ready for this? To worship. I don't know if that would have been my response. I don't know if I just found out that all my girls were dead. If my first response would be to hit the ground in worship? What's going on? Like, how does this make sense? What is going on in Job's mind in this moment? It's wild to me. You know, we, here we are, we're, on, we're at Super Bowl Sunday. I can tell you with total certainty the Ravens aren't going to win. <laughs> but imagine for just a moment, all right? Imagine for just a moment that there's a, you know, the fourth quarter, 
There's seven seconds left on the clock. The team you want to win is down by two. They got the ball. The 50-yard line. They got one chance to kick a field goal and win the game. I bet in that moment you'd have everybody in your house Super quiet. Everybody all over the country watching the game would be super quiet in this moment. The whole stadium, you know, everyone in Vegas would be watching this live, and the whole stadium would be hushed, wanting to see what's about to happen as that ball gets kicked by a foot, and it's in the air. You would probably be able to hear a pin drop. I imagine that this is what heaven sounded like in this moment. The angels have just watched God give permission to go pick on this guy. And everyone's just gathered around saying, shh. It's about to happen. We just took away all his stuff. God allowed Satan to, to, to kill his children. I'm sure even the demons, wherever they're at, they're all watching, thinking, ah, watch what's about to happen. Everybody is ex- expecting something different. And in that moment, everybody's watching, and it says that Job tore his robe in grief, and then he hit the ground and worshiped. I bet Satan was pretty frustrated by this outcome. This is not the way he was wanting the game to go. Here's number four. You ready? Number four is that God remains in control. No matter what happens in your life, no matter good or bad, no matter if it makes sense to you, uh, whether you're at a good day or a bad day, I want you to know that even in the midst of everything that's happening to Job right here, God remains in control. This is his response. He hits the ground to worship. In verse 21, it says, he said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. In other words, I came with nothing. And I'm going to go away with nothing. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Whew. That's Job chapter 1. You see how awesome this series is going to be? <laughs> so, you know, God just, uh, we, we just talked about how God, allows, and God wrecks, and then God permits, and then God remains. Those same four things you just wrote down in your notes, those things are going to repeat in Job chapter 2. In fact, let me give you a brief recap of the first half of chapter 2. There's another staff meeting, and for some reason, God allows Satan to be present at that staff meeting. Satan comes probably moping in, a little discouraged by the loss he just experienced down on earth with Job, but he's also got another plan. And so God asks uh, Satan again, where are you coming from? He's like, I've been destroying Job's stuff. And he simply says, okay, well, have you considered Job? He, you did all that, and he, he, didn't, he didn't turn on me. And here's what Satan says. Chapter 2, verse 4. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin. A man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health, and he will surely curse you to your face. He's coming with that same confidence he had before. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, you took away his stuff, but you didn't take away his health. And then God, again, gives him the okay. He permits bad things to happen to Job. In verse 7, Satan's response, it says, So Satan left the Lord's presence, and he stroked Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die already. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only the good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. So once again, God allows, God directs, God permits, and God remains. And through it all, Job remains steadfast. A quick side note about Job's wife. Have you ever considered this before? What kind of a piece of work must this woman be? (laughs) 
that when Satan has permission to touch everything Job has except for Job, <laughs> Satan's thinking to himself, you know what? I think it's... actually be more painful we leave her alive. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Satan could have easily said, all right, let's wipe out the kids and this woman Job loves so dearly. Let's kill her too. No, she's left to be part of this story. All right. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> the side note. Here's how chapter two ends. Chapter two ends with Job's friends coming to, to help him grieve. I want you to read that on your own at home. Chapter three is really powerful, all right? What you're gonna read in chapter three are the thoughts that are going on in Job's head. What would you be thinking in this moment? And what's interesting is Job does not curse the Lord. He instead curses the day he was born. He wishes he had never been alive because of what's just happened to him. So go read that. That'll set us up for chapter four next Sunday. But here's what I want you to walk away with today. I wanna to give you five quick takeaways that you can apply to your life, you can apply to your suffering, you can apply to bad things that are happening to you. Uh, the first thing I want you to know, the ma major takeaway, is God is in control of everything. Can you say that with me? God is in control of everything. He is sovereign. Satan cannot do anything that God does not permit, that he does not allow. God is in control of everything. In Psalm 135, verse six, it says, the Lord does whatever pleases him throughout all heaven and earth and on the seas and in their depths. I love this reminder. It's simple that God does whatever pleases God. In other words, it pleased God to allow these things to happen to Job. That's hard to process, but it's true. Isaiah 46 Starting in verse 9, it says, Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. And then listen to this. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. See, what God's word wants us to know about God is that He is always in control. What God wants to happen will happen. If something happens to you that you don't like, that doesn't feel that great, that something is taken from you that you wish wasn't taken from you, you know, it doesn't change the fact that God is still in control and allowed that thing to happen. Here's the second thing. This one's probably a little harder. You ready? God doesn't owe you an answer. I hate this truth. I like to understand why things happen. When something really cruddy happens in my life, I'm like, God, will you just kind of give me a sneak peek as to why you allowed that to happen, how you use that for your good? I know all things work together for good, but I would really like to know how that was worked together for good because that felt really crummy. But the truth is, it says in Deuteronomy 29, our Lord, our God has secrets known to no one. How about this? In Isaiah 55, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Here's what God is simply saying. Not only am I in control, but I know what I'm doing. And in many cases, you wouldn't be able to process it and understand it if I told you. And I don't owe you an answer. There are going to be things that happen in your life that maybe one day God will permit the answer to you as you're standing before him in heaven. You'll say, hey, God, remember that year where you took away my job and my dad and my house and everything all at once? <laughs> what was that about? And he might say, yeah, that's between me and me. I know what I'm doing. God doesn't owe you an answer. Number three, don't let your feelings call the shots in your life. Don't let how you're feeling determine how you behave and the words that come out of your mouth. You have to decide how you're gonna act and what you're gonna say and what you're gonna do based on the truth 
And the truth is that God's always in control and he doesn't owe you an answer. So we can base our response on what's real and not our feelings. Listen, there's nothing wrong with God gave us our feelings. It's, it's okay to have feelings. Just don't base your, your life. Don't let your feelings call it the shots. Number four, I want you to understand that God is not a stranger to sacrifice. You just think, well, why does God just, he just likes causing pain sometimes, it seems like. Why does God just, uh, what does he know? Well, I want you to understand that God the Father was willing to send his son to this earth to die on the cross for you, out of love for you. And so to imagine that he doesn't know at all what it feels like to sacrifice or to give up something that he loves, and to, that for Jesus to give up the comforts of heaven, the power and the dominion of heaven, to come down and be here amongst us broken people in this broken world. I want you to understand God is not a stranger to sacrifice. In Mark 10, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And here's the fifth thing that we're going to close with this morning. If you have God and nothing else, you have more than enough. Would you say that with me? If you have God and nothing else, you have more than enough. There's a passage in Habakkuk. It's one of my favorite Old Testament passages of Scripture. In Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 17 it says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, here's the, here's the whole story Habakkuk is, is, is laying out for us. Even though you got nothing, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The fact that I have a relationship with God the Father, and he's son to this earth to die on the cross for me, it doesn't really matter what he does with the little itty bitty sliver of time that is my life in this little piece of time on the whole span of eternity. If I've got a relationship with God and nothing else, I have plenty of reason to rejoice and worship God. You know, there's a chorus. You remember um, how we always end our services here. We ask a three word prayer to God. What now, God? God, what do you want us to do with Job chapter one and Job chapter two and Job chapter 3. What are we supposed to do with all this information? And this chorus that Rachel's playing right now, I think is a really great reminder. What does Job do when he's got a really crummy day? He drops to the ground and he worships because worship is such a powerful uh, connection that reminds us who we are in light of who God is. That's what worship is. It's recognizing God is good and God is great and ultimately we are not, right? And so Job gets on his knee and he worships God. It ought to be the first response that each of us have in the midst of suffering. So here's my what now God exhortation for us as a church. I want to encourage you when you're having a crummy day, a crummy week, a crummy year, when you get that bit of bad news, I bet none of us is having as bad of a day as Job had. And yet Job was able to realize the power of getting on the ground and worshiping God. And the, the powerful lyrics of worship songs that are based on the truth of God's word, like this song right here. What does this song remind us of? It reminds us of two very powerful things, right? You are good. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, right? And I am loved. It's who I am. It's who I am. Those are like the two things you just need to know in the midst of suffering. That God's a good, good father. And that you are loved. It doesn't matter what you got or what was taken from you. You came here with nothing. You're going to leave with nothing. Maybe we can um, sing the chorus of this song together.
I'm all stuffed up and sick, so I apologize for my lousy leading. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. If you're in this room right now and you're hurting, you're in a season of struggle, let's sing that song one more time. I I want you to sing this song. I want you to mean it. You ready? You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. that in the midst of a a season of suffering like Job experienced far greater than any of us probably ever have, that we can come to you with a simple acknowledgement that you are always in control, that you don't owe us an answer for what you do. We probably wouldn't even be able to understand it if you could explain it. God, at the end of the day, we want to rely on what's true instead of our feelings. And the truth is you are not a stranger to suffering. You've experienced suffering incredible suffering so that you can have a relationship with us and so that we can when we experience hardship we can get on our knees in front of you and simply be reminded of the truth that you are a good good father that's who you are and we are loved by you that's who we are and that that is enough we love you and we thank you for this time to open up your word together we pray this in jesus name amen Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.